it's Adam from Pixel, and I'm very excited to bring you Spider-Man into the Spider-Verse, the art of the movie. Of course, we're going to be paying particular attention to the art, of course, being an art book and being an art channel. And there's a lot to take away from this, not only from a designer's perspective, but from an animator's perspective as well. This, this film is revolutionary with regards to the design, what they actually tackled being a comic book style of art and translating that into an animated film in an absolutely brilliant way. So let's crack this open right away. And we're gonna flip ahead a couple of pages past the introduction over here, start to get an idea of the artistic style, which is absolutely beautiful. And I first want to talk about one of the things that they discuss in this book right away. And that was um, translating comic books into film. And the original approach that they just, they wanted the, they explored with was exploring a more clean, stylized approach to comic book art. The kind of stuff that you very often see in comic books. But myself not coming from a comic book background, one of the things that I really love and respect about comic book art is how, how they capture that richness and grit of urban living. And they decided to translate a grittier, dirtier style of art into the film. And that's what, what ultimately led to it being so believable in this comic book sense. The challenge they had, as they describe here, is bridging the gap between reality and fantasy, something very similar to the Big Hero 6 book, which I reviewed. You can check it out right here. Um, and they uh, approached this with a very loose painterly style that you can see very offset textures, uh, litter and water stains all over the place. They're trying to capture that in a way that also made it animatable. Now, one of the things that's really neat is particularly if you look at this page over here, if I zoom in a little bit, I want to draw your attention to something. And that is, if you look up nice and close, you're going to see this use of a very dotted type of, of inking, which um, if you're familiar with any kind of original comic book publications, any kind of print, newspapers, comic books and stuff like that were printed with dots. And what you might not know is that this this technique of creating imagery through the juxtaposition of dots originated from, well, originally impressionism, but then pointillism by artists like, for instance, Georges Seurat. This ended up translating into newspaper print and then eventually into comic book print as well to recreate that original comic book feel, which I thought was really, really fascinating. One of the artists that this makes me think of is an artist I talk about all, of, all the time on my channel, Marco Bucci. And he actually has a tutorial on his website, which I'll plug unapologetically, if you go to marcobucci.com, I'll leave a link in the description below, um, where he teaches brush techniques, very similar to what you're seeing here, to get a more painterly look in digital painting. But here, in this case, they used it to create a more graphic, graphic novel type of look. Um, but you can see how these techniques are very interchangeable, so definitely go and check it out. It's dirt cheap, so yeah, go buy it. Again, referencing the Big Hero 6 book review that I, that I did, if you go and check it out, an amazing book, by the way, Another challenge that the artist had here was capturing modern day Manhattan, but in a simplified and stylized way so that it would fit into the comic book uh, um, ecosystem. And what was really interesting was or one of the big challenges they had was they wanted to make it feel realistic. They wanted to feel like when you were looking at these very stylized animated characters, they felt very rooted in reality, even more so than Big Hero 6 because of this very graphic comic book style. And you could see they did this by, by really unifying the color palettes and creating exaggerated contrasts and scale so that it felt like it was rooted in real life, but at the same time felt a little bit surreal and fantastical. Here's just another beautiful example. I love, it's probably one of my favorite illustrations and a beautiful use of a leading line. You can see in this piece how your eyes get immediately drawn to the tiny little characters, which compositionally is quite challenging. So what, what the artist did was use a lot of strong leading lines that would lead your eyes right to these two characters. And notice how from a color perspective, they stand out. There's a little bit of a punch of color over here. But again, using this very texturally overlaid type of uh, um, very digital graphic textures to create this very comic book style. Just, I just wanted to stop and admire it because it's a beautiful piece. What you might not know about this design that I thought was kind of neat was that his hair is styled and his kind of look is styled loosely off of Brad Pitt from A River Runs Through It. Now that you see it, you can't unsee it, can you? It kind of gave him that very classical, handsome type of appearance. Now, something that you're going to see in almost pretty much every animation book that I cover are color keys such as these. And if you look at this panel, it's kind of walking you through 
the moods and the tempos of all of these different scenes based off of the color and lighting alone. Something you've seen in Monsters, Inc. You can check it out right here as well. Uh, all of the Pixar books that I covered always have these, these kind of spreads in the middle that show these beautiful color keys. And you can literally take a walk through all of the different scenes based on their overlying mood and theme. A very, very practical, very useful practice for you as an artist. Now, the artist behind this very iconic style of Miles Morales over here that you can also see on the front cover of the book as well and all throughout the book is by Alberto Mielgo. And um, you might not know this as well, that the designer for Into the Spider-Verse uh, was Justin Thompson, the, the designer for Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs. And as soon as you see that, as soon as you hear that, you think both from a very clean design perspective and from an animation perspective, you can see where all of these very gifted, very iconic animation styles came from as well. That same kind of ecosystem of influence, in my humble opinion, um, Spider Into the Spider-Verse and Cloudy with a Chance of Pe Meatballs, from an animator's perspective, and I know a lot of animators would attest to this as well, is one of the most absolutely brilliant animations out there as far as animation style is concerned. I wanna stop on this page for a moment to point something out in its own unique way. This was, of course, this, this film was made by Sony, but Sony Pixar, they were, all, these are all artists that come from a very similar uh, background animation-wise. But notice how minimalistic and simplified. Notice how the forms are very suggestive and very objective. These aren't literal shapes. They're not fleshing out every single little leaf and every single little detail. It's very rough because the, the artist's goal in this art was to capture a mood and a color palette that in this particular case describes multiple different cultures. The, the African-American influence of the father from the Puerto Rican influence of the mother, because Miles Morales is kind of a cross between these two different cultures. And this house is supposed to be a representation of these two different influences in the same home. But notice the simplicity. If you check out my, my review for Incredibles, for the Incredibles 2 book, uh, which you can check out right here, um, it, very much when you look at the, with the concept art, it's very rough. The artist is not trying to show off their artistic chops. They're trying to get you into a mood, capture a moment. Now, of course, I've got to laugh at this. Every single time there's a film which that represents a young teenage boy, like in Big Hero 6, um, you've got to have the messy bedroom, right? And you can see how, how evocative this is, how fun it is to look at a very busy, busy environment. I have to stop for a moment. The overly geared dad. This is probably one of the funniest things. And his face, oh my God, he reminds me so much of my friend Jimmy. Actually, I could, you can check it out right here. I did an interview with my friend Jimmy years ago. He just, not only Jimmy himself, but the way he described his father, you know, this Haitian dad who would, he'd chew spearmint gum all the time and he just, just a deadpan serious guy. And Jimmy has this, my friend Jimmy has this, when you walk down the street, you see this extremely serious face, but I look at it and I want to smile and laugh because I know the, I know the, the joker that Jimmy is. So I see this extremely <laughs> serious dad and it makes me want to laugh, especially when you gear him up. It's something Jimmy would do too. He's very, um, very fashion sensitive, right? So he's an incredibly geared up cop. I love this design and I love the character. It's just, it's so endearing. And in that, you could see here what they're describing in him is that he's a tough guy, right? He's a cop. He's supposed to convey toughness, but at the same time, he's supposed to be a warm and comforting character. And so he's very loving. Uh, uh, very close father and stuff like that, but still has that tough guy side to him. Like that scene in the beginning of the film, spoiler alert, where he gets, he forces his son to say, I love you with the speaker in front of the school, embarrassing him in front of all of his kids. I do that for sure. Now, when you look at the, his uncle, uh, he's the cool uncle, the kind of cool guy that everybody, that, that, that Miles really wants to get to know better. So you see, there's a lot more stylization. He's a little less practical in family oriented because he's a sing he's a bachelor essentially so they're trying to convey the location and the looks to give him a little bit more st the neon lights the cool speakers the leather couch more of a pad with video games and stuff like that somebody a lot more relatable to a teenage boy now when it comes to character designs at least in this particular case where they were exploring body designs of all the different varying students notice something from a design perspective this is an artistic lesson i find that artists tend to always pick or very often pick idealized figures the typical idealized male or idealized female figure. And that is extremely limiting artistically. You'd be surprised just how much of your artistry you can unlock by exploring different physiques. Study fat, study cellulites, study 
old people's aged skin and features, aged anatomy and skeletal structures. You'd be amazed how much that feeds and can unlock you artistically. Here's an interesting thing about the film itself, which, which kind of contrasts Incredibles 2. In the case of Miles, the challenge was designing a character who, who became a superhero without asking for it. He got bitten by the spider and he developed these superpowers. If you compare that to The Incredibles, um, uh, in The Incredibles, they're born with superpowers and want to use the superpowers, but are held back by society. Where in, in Spider-Man, he doesn't want to. He just wants to be a normal kid, but is forced to live the superhero life and has to come to terms with that. It's a coming of age film, essentially, but coming of age as a superhero, which is an added challenge. Now, from any artist's perspective, if you look at these tunnel designs and a lot of the other designs we've already covered, these were done by none other than the great Craig Mullins, which just a little, a little homage to the great artist who produced this beautiful work. And you can see, you can definitely see that beautiful design aesthetic in his use of forms here. I love Craig Mullins' work. Another thing that I find modern superhero recreations or rewrites, if you look at Batman, if you look at Superman, if you look at a lot of these different characters, one of the things I love about the, the fact that they approach this in an animated film is that he's not a quote, flawlessly optimistic character, that he's human and that he has to reinterpret the world that he's living through. Despite his powers, he has to reinterpret the world through the eyes of a very regular, ordinary person who has good days and bad days and has a very believable personality and outlook on the world, but has to adapt that to an exceptional circumstance. So in the design, that design has to reflect that he's not this, you know, Captain America type of thing, that he has flaw and he has inner struggles that he has to work through in order to be successful as a superhero. I love this character so much. There, these little potbelly. And I love, look at these gorgeous gesture lines. Oh, the crisscross across his shoulders. These are just beautiful. The three-point landing. You always have to have your three-point landing. Look at that gorgeous line. Really nicely done. Very confident line work. And the last thing I want to mention here, and I'm going to flash you guys in a second, so I apologize in advance for this. I didn't know that the environment designs, all of this natural greenery, were inspired by Bill Watterson. And if you're not familiar with who Bill Watterson is, get familiar with him. He was the creator of Kelvin and Hobbes. And I'm such a huge fan of Kelvin and Hobbes that I ended up tattooing him on my shoulder <laughs> back when I was 18 years old. He's kind of a, he's kind of my alter ego, so to speak. And it just so turned out that my son Lucas turned out to look exactly like him. I have a picture of Lucas when he was a little guy who had that spiky Kelvin hair and he, he has Kelvin's mischief in as well. He's, he's a bit of a naughty kid, but I absolutely loved that fact that they inspired this landscape off of that particular character. I thought that was really endearing. So with that said, hopefully you enjoyed my little overview of this beautiful book. If you haven't seen it, it's not only a masterpiece in terms of its artistic uh, achievements, but also from its animation achievements, how they use different frame rates for different characters to give off a more old school or new school type of tempo and type of feeling to the film is an absolute beautiful film. And the book itself, I find, speaks for itself visually. Even You don't even have to read the book and you can appreciate it just for the visuals. So I very much appreciate you joining me today on this wonderful adventure. And of course, I love you all and happy painting. Take care.